Hello and welcome. My headphones audio is much quieter today than usual, so I'll wait for the uh for the good to go. Hey, look at that. All right, cool. Um we have a well, I'll, I'll flip over and show you what the runway looks like in a second here, but for anyone new to the stream, each week we pick a new national park to explore together. This week we're exploring uh Wrangell St. Elias National Park in Alaska. We'll also vote near the end on the next national park we'd like to go to. So look out for that another post coming in the chat. Uh, also, feel free to post questions or thoughts as we're going around. I love chatting with you all, so uh, whatever's on your mind, feel free to throw it out there. I mentioned last week that I stopped doing sort of like the uh, semi-cheesy sort of prompt questions, um, but like just thoughts, ideas, questions of your own. Um, I always, always love it. Uh, small disclaimer, yes, I am a pilot, but we'll be taking full advantage of the simulator today. So please don't try this in real life. I've also researched the park and a couple of related topics in preparation and helped improve their Wikipedia pages. Using Wikipedia, make sure the facts here are cited and checked by others, and gives back to a living body of knowledge that goes beyond our hour here together. To that end, if you notice anything uh, missing or that could be better clarified, please help improve the wiki pages. As the wiki community often says, be bold and make the updates. So without further ado, I'm Jules Altus and I'll be your pilot for this evening. So sit back, relax, and let's explore Wrangell St. Elias National Park. Flip myself back here. I think there's another... Uh airplane somewhere floating around behind me. All right, we're taking a jet around because this is the largest national park in the country. There we go. Got that Kenmore livery going. The largest national park in the country, and so... I gotta... Let me know how that sounds now. Um, but the Wrangell St. Elias is the largest national park, and so the only way we could realistically fly around it is, um, is in a jet. So... Now, if you were actually going to go out here and go flying in the backcountry, you could take a, a little Super Cub, and we'll actually watch a video of a pilot who does backcountry flying here. Let me zoom in so you can see where we're going. All right. Thank you, Fractals, for posting up that uh, the link and the poll. So I'm going to get my autopilot set up here real quick while people respond to that. Uh, we're climbing up to 15 thousand feet so we've got quite a bit of ways to go here oops let me make sure i'm okay so what i'm going to do is actually turn on nav mode and then i'll set my desired final altitude to fifteen thousand. and my vertical speed i'm gonna turn on vertical speed mode and set that to five thousand. i do not know how to fly jets in real life um so i'm sort of winging it hopefully this isn't a Oh, okay, thank you. Hey, P-Banger. Uh, yes, I am a real pilot. I don't fly jets, though, but I do fly smaller planes. Um, so I'm sort of winging it on the on the big jet here, but I think this seemed to work at least when I was practicing it. So it climbs incredibly fast. Also flip out there so you can see. Now, Flying Singer is doing the alternate approach, which I think also works really well. So if you stay low, you can actually get towards the mountains. Um, very early on, we're going to have to pass uh, Mount St. Elise, which is a very tall mountain, and so I want to just get up high so that I can get away from the, the mountain. But, uh, but you can stay a little lower, too. The plane climbs really well. All right, I think we are on our way. Oh, thanks, Fractals. Winging it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I know, right? All right, so... I mentioned that we're taking a jet, so this is a, I'm in a Citation uh, Longitude. Uh, you can also take the Citation CJ4 if you like that plane as well. It works just fine. Uh, just some, something fast for the distance we're going. I also have it at about 4 o'clock local time, for those of you who want to sync up uh, clocks on here. Oops, you can't see that. That seems to work pretty well. Uh, yeah, so we'll start with those settings, and then once we pass Mount Wrangell, about... 30 minutes or so in, then uh, 45 minutes or so in, then we'll start to descend to about 8,000 feet. And then the final landing is at sea level. So we go up 15,000 and then we go down 15,000. It's pretty quick. Yeah, P Banger, come and join. Um, so I turned off all of my safety critical stressing sort of things on here, um, which is partially for my own sanity while I'm <laughs> live streaming it. Um, and P Banger, what I do is I'll talk through a couple of different topics as we go flying around. So it's sort of uh, visual exploration, group flight, and then just um, various topics relevant to the park. Uh, yes, and then 
the flight plan fractals posted it just a minute ago uh, maybe you can post it again if you're trying to find it so it looks like the number one choice is not been to this park yet uh, which is fair it's a pretty pretty out there kind of park it's pretty close to glacier bay national park if you end up up in that region for for any reason all right a couple quick administrative updates while we get going here so the at sometime in the next couple of days i'll post a, a poll to discord to talk about when we might want to do a more casual flight so something that is not something i prep for and it's just more uh, maybe pick a flight plan and go somewhere fun um, so if folks are interested in doing something like that uh, this came up in the chat a couple of days ago so i'll post something about that in a little bit a uh, quick shout out to another flight uh, community contributor bad weapon so he did an alaska terrain fix uh, add-on which i highly recommend so that'll kind of fix some of the elevation issues some of the rivers look a little bit better I use the same one in Kenai Fjords. And then I also mentioned this uh, in the Discord chat we were talking before, but I installed the Bushtalk Radio's uh, Points of Interest pack, which I'd also highly recommend. So you'll see a couple of mountains labeled as we fly around and some other things. Um, the ones that have kind of a destination point, like this um, uh, Malaspina the glacier up ahead, uh, that one is one for the flight plan. And then you'll see other ones going around um, for you know Mount Blackburn and things that will pass along. Right. Uh, p you don't necessarily meet, need the mod if you don't want to. Uh, it works just fine as, as is. It's just a little... It's pretty obvious when the train's wrong. It looks like the river's are like 60 feet below the train, so it's stuff like that. But it's okay. All right. So while we make our way to uh, this glacier, I'm actually going to do a quick mention on here. So uh, Malaspina Glacier is a enormous glacier that is actually larger than the state of Rhode Island. So just to give some context for how big this block of ice up ahead is. Let me quick pull up a picture here so you can see what it looks like in the real world. So that's the actual glacier. So you can fit all of Rhode Island. I think Rhode Island's like, uh, I'm gonna pull some numbers that aren't necessarily correct, but it's like a thousand square feet or so, and then square feet, square miles, and this one's like a thousand five hundred square miles or some something in that range. That ratio is correct about um, two to one. I'm sorry, I'm not going to do that math in my head correctly. Three to two. Um, but yeah, so kind of a, a incredibly large glacier and, and pretty neat to see. We'll also come up on Mount St. Elias in just a moment here, so I'll pull this photo up. That's the mountain just off there in the distance. We'll pass right by it so you'll see it. Uh, but Mount St. Elias is, of course, one of the mountains that the park is named after. So it's Wrangell St. Elias National Park. All right, now I started doing a thing where I pull the park purpose statement and actually paste it so you can read it. So this is the Wrangell St. Elias National Park uh, purpose statement. So the purpose of Wrangell St. Elias Park and Preserve is to maintain the natural scenic beauty of the diverse ecological, glacial, uh, riparian dominated landscapes and to protect the attendant wildlife populations and their habitats, to ensure continued access for a wide range of wilderness based recreation opportunities, and provide and to provide continued opportunities for subsistence use. They do actually have the full park video posted online. And so if you're interested to watch that, it's about 23 minutes long. I liked it. It was very good for a theater, I would say. It's not great for a live stream where I kind of want a condensed bit of information. Um, but it turns out that they have a lot of the same footage in a interview they did with a backcountry pilot for the national park so i'm going to play a about a five minute clip of a a person who works at the national park a lot and they do backcountry flights he'll talk a little bit about what his career is and he uses a i think he uses a super cub and goes and fly around so it's a nice little little sidebar for pilots but also then a pretty good overview so look for the incredible sights of the park and some of the highlights that ooh, it's so big that we're just never going to see them all um, so kind of take in some of the the magnificent differences going on all right. Oops, got loaded up on here already. I'm spoiled with my lifestyle. I mean, I started out as a child in the backseat of a Super Cub, and my dad flew everywhere. And, and so I just kind of grew up with it, and I kind of accept it as um, it's just natural for us.
I'm Lynn Ellis and I grew up on a homestead in the Wrangell St. Elias National Park and Preserve. I've been flying within these mountains since I was 16 years old. When I was a little kid, my dad took me on my first airplane ride, flew up there and flew over the edge of the Nebesna Glacier. Of course, I, I was probably, what, seven years old, maybe? And uh, I never have forgotten that. It, the ability to be able to access places that are inaccessible, basically. I mean, that's a real gift. And I'm really thankful that I've managed to, to be able to do that all my life. freedom here and so much beauty and it never gets old. I don't know the words for it, I'm at a loss for words, but it's just awesome. This is where I grew up and so it, it becomes home more than anything. My mother was one hell of a backwards lady. She taught us all the things that we needed to know. It was a subsistence, a true subsistence lifestyle. I worked for my dad as soon as I got to be old enough to do things and was in his guide business. I started my air service, my crew air charter, out of Gulf Canyon for like 30 years out of it. My job designation now is 2181 pilot. So what I do is I fly for the park. I primarily, I haul a lot of the maintenance people around because it's the only access we have is by air. I fly search and rescue missions if they come up. I fly the rangers and the LEs. And we do uh, eagle surveys, we do moose surveys, we do caribou surveys, we do wolf surveys. Air traffic, uh, 757's overhead, Jake's bar, 4,000. And what I really wanted to do when I came here was to pass on my knowledge of the Wrangles to the younger rangers that are coming in and to be able to mentor the pilots, the newer pilots that come in. And as I get older, I realize that my time is running out. I just seem to pay more attention now to nature than I did before. I actually think that it, it helps me deal with the mortality of the human race. I think that if we can keep what we got, basically, especially the wilderness designations, I just think that to have this vastness that we have is unique, and we should endeavor to keep it like it is. You really begin to feel humble and you feel small in these mountains. I like the feeling of small. And you get up against one of these mountains and you're in your, your airplane and it's so tiny, it's, it's smaller than any mosquito ever was. And you fly around this mountain and look at it and it's like, it's a good feeling. It's just a really good feeling to know that there's bigger and better things out there.
pretty cool. It's a neat park. It's uh, unfathom unfathomably big. And the park video, uh, the other one I mentioned, talks a lot about how big it is, which uh, is interesting the first couple of times. But, um, but a lot of good shots in it. So. All right. So that's the uh, the kind of uh, background on the park. I'm getting a, a cue, so I'm trying to make sure that I'm not missing something. We'll we'll see. I think I explained this last time, but we have uh, post-it notes on the wall in front of me, which sort of works sometimes. But I've managed to put the microphone right in my line of sight, um, so I think that'll work. Uh, anyway. If you see a little green dot on my face or something, that's what that is. Okay, um, please don't shine any more eyes. <laughs> uh, anyway, okay. <laughs> person of this week. So each week picks a different person to talk about. For this week, we're going to talk about President Jimmy Carter. So here's a picture of what he looks like. And let's get that loading. There we go. So Wrangell, why are this person for this park? Wrangell St. Elias National Monument was, de was designated on December 1st, 1978 by President Jimmy Carter using the Antiquities Act, pending final legislation to resolve allotment of public lands in Alaska. So he was the one who sort of set up the National Monument part of it, at least. Bit of background on him. James Earl Carter Jr. was born October 1st, 1924. He's still alive. He's an, he was an, or is an American politician, businessman, and philanthropist who served as the 29th, 39th, excuse me, President of the United States from 1977 to 1981. Raised in Georgia, Carter graduated from the United States Naval Academy with a Bachelor of Science degree and joined the U.S. Navy, where he served on submarines. After the death of his father in 1953, Carter left his naval career and returned home to Georgia to take up the reins in the family's peanut growing business. During that time, he got involved in, uh, in, it was motivated to oppose the political climate of racial segregation and supported the growing civil rights movement. Uh, he became an activist in the Democratic Party, served in the Georgia State Senate from 63 to 67, and then in, seven, in 1970, he was elected the jo governor of Georgia. He remained governor until 75, and then in 1976, won the presidential nomination and narrowly defeated the incumbent president, uh, Gerald Ford, for president. On his second day in office, Carter pardoned all Vietnam War draft evaders by using Proclamation 4483. And during his term as president, an, uh, among a number of accomplishments, he introduced two new cabinet level departments, the Department of Energy and the Department of Education. In 1980, Carter lost the general election to Republican nominee Ronald Reagan in an electoral landslide. He's the only president in U.S. history to serve a full term in office and never appoint a Supreme Court justice. In 1982, Carter established the Carter Center to promote and expand human rights. This is all post-presidency. He, he has traveled extensively to conduct peace negotiations, monitor elections, and advance disease protection and eradication in developing nations. Carter is considered a key figure in the charity Habitat for Humanity. In 2020, I'm sorry, in 2002, he was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for his work in co-founding uh, the Carter Center. Polls of historians and political scientists usually rank Carter as an, a below average president, uh, but they, but since leaving the presidency, people have viewed him more favorably, so it's more favorable than the presidency himself, based on the work he did afterwards. So, a little bit about uh, President Carter. All right, let me pull up real quick this river we're flying over here, uh, Chitina River, looks like this in real life so it's a little bit more braided that's called that kind of pattern in the game it just renders as one giant river but it, it's not quite like that uh, a lot of the rivers in here folks will go rafting on so if you're into that sort of thing you can actually raft and then you kind of get carried between the different braids of the river it's a pretty fun way to go all right and that takes us into our first topic uh, fractals, do you mind posting up the poll here? Thank you very much. So our first topic is copper. We'll talk about why copper in a second. So which elements are in the same group, this is the periodic group, as copper on the periodic table? Is it silver and gold, helium and neon, or fire and water? 
give folks a second here to vote on that. Now, the reason to talk about copper in this park is at the center of the park, there's a boom, tall, a boom town of Kennecott. And this uh, exploited one of the world's richest deposits of core from 1903 to 1938, 35 years. The abandoned mine buildings and mills comprise the National Historic Landmark District. So we're actually coming up on uh, the Kennecott Visitor Center and then the city of Kennecott in just a moment here. So we're going to fly right over it. It doesn't render as much in the game, so uh, don't get your hopes up too high. But I will point it out as we pass by. And essentially what happened was they noticed a uh, vein in the mountainside and said, that looks like copper. Let's go mine the side of that mountain. And, uh, and that's what they did. So that's how Kennecott came to be. It's got a very cool story of engineering behind it. Um, but we're going to just watch the first couple of minutes on this stream here. Oops. My autopilot on this plane has been very finicky, so I don't know if folks have had a little bit better luck than me, maybe. Mm -hmm. I might need to hand fly this. All right, we'll see how that goes. Uh, hand flying a jet sounds like fun. So like I said, there's a, a good, like, probably 10 minute long video or something. We'll watch the first. Uh, just a minute here, 12 minute long video, it looks like. At the beginning of the 20th century, the world was hungry for copper. Copper was essential for building ships, locomotives, and automobiles. Every home needed copper pipes. Electricity was the energy of the future, and copper wire was the key to bringing electricity to the world. In 1900, two prospectors discovered the richest deposit of copper ore left in the American West. The copper was on a steep, rocky peak, surrounded by rivers of ice in the heart of the Alaskan wilderness. This region of Alaska is now known as Wrangell St. Elias National Park and Preserve. The exceptional richness of the copper ore shocked the mining world. Typically, copper ore contains 10% copper. This ore contained as much as 85% copper. So that's a little bit about copper, just a, a small teaser. And that town of Kennecott is actually going to be just off to our left here in just a moment. It's kind of right down, nestled alongside that glacier there. For the poll, it looks like we have the majority got it correct on here. So silver and gold is the correct answer. And we'll talk about the periodic table a bit more, kind of how copper fits into that bigger picture. All right. Let me see if I can turn my autopilot back on. How mad the plane gets at me, we'll see. All right, so what is copper? Probably seen it before, so this is what copper looks like. Copper is a chemical element with the symbol Cu in the atomic number 29. It is soft, malleable, and uh, ductile uh, metal with very high thermal and electrical conductivity. The freshly exposed surface of pure copper has a pinkish orange color, so you can kind of see that color here. Copper is important for a couple of reasons. It's used as a conductor of heat and electricity and as a building material and as a conduit uh, constituent of various metal alloys, such as sterling silver used in jewelry, uh, copper nickel used to make uh, marine hardware and coins, and uh, constantin used in strain gauges and thermal couples for temperature measurement. Um, okay, so where, where did it get its name from? In the Roman era, copper was mined principally on Cyprus, and so they called it, a I'm not going to get my, my uh, language correct here, but it's like Ace Cyperum. So Metal of Cyprus is what it translated to. And that later got corrupted into cuprum, so from cyprum to cuprum. And then copper became the modern spelling of it uh, about eight, or 1530. So it went through a couple of different changes, but it's an old, old metal. Copper has a, a number of different uses. It's one of the few metals that occur in nature and is directly usable in that metallic form. So people who found copper in Wrangell St. Elias in this national park could actually use those tools. Uh, when they first started realizing there might be copper around was when they saw native folks had been building tools out of copper. It's kind of an odd thing unless there's copper in the area. 
because it uh, exists in that directly usable form, uh, it was used very early by humans from about 8000 BC. And then thousands of years later, in 5000 BC, it was smelted together um, into different ores, and then it could be cast in different molds. It was also the first metal to be purposely alloyed with another metal, tin, so they started making bronze out of copper and tin in about 3500 BC. So it's a long, long history for this element. Major, here, let me point out real quick. So we're passing Mount Blackburn here, which is a pretty, pretty mountain. Just around the corner here, we have the McCarthy Main Road, is that town that I pointed out we were passing. So this is kind of what it looks like now. And this is the, the local town in the area. And then the Kennecott Mining Complex would be the actual mining district. And that video that I mentioned, I'll post it in the Discord afterwards, but that video talks about why there's so many buildings in this complex to make the mining work. It's a pretty good overview of the whole thing. Uh, two other ones I'll show real quick. This is the Doho Peak and Kennecott Glacier. So that's the area we just flew up and then the Mount Blackburn, which we just passed on the left here, that's Mount Blackburn. Very, very pretty, very majestic mountain, in my opinion. All right, so major applications of copper are electrical wire, about 60% of its uses. It's also used in roofing and plumbing, about 20%, and 15% is used for industrial machinery. It's mostly used as a pure metal, but when greater hardness is required, it can be made into an alloy, such as brass uh, and bronze, and that's about 5% of its total use. In the poll, we talked about its relationship to silver and gold, so that's the correct answer on this one is copper, silver, and gold are in group 11 of the periodic table. So we're going to do, I promise, just a little bit of chemistry, not a ton of chemistry. Uh, but if you remember, the periodic table looks like this. A group is this column going down. So copper is up here at 29, and silver is beneath it, and gold is beneath it. And that has to do with the way the electrons fill out in the atom. So I'll pull up a picture real quick of copper. Uh, if your chemistry is is a uh, little or needs a refresher, then I won't I won't dive in too much here. But the important thing is, in this outer shell of electrons, copper only has one electron that floats out here, and so that's what gives it a lot of its properties. Uh, that's things like the ductility, the electrical and thermal conduct conductivity. That's all because of that that little extra electron that hangs out. It's also why. So you notice that copper. Uh, has a natural color that isn't gray or silver. Most metals have a natural color of gray or silver. The reason for that is that the energy difference between that electron in the very outer shell versus the electrons beneath it, the difference in that energy is the equivalent of an orange color. So without going into all the chemistry behind it, which I don't think I would get correct anyway, um, the short version is like the energy difference there gives it that orange color. Uh, group 11 is also known is also sometimes called the coinage metals because it was often used in making coins so common for that sort of thing copper has a bunch of other properties that you've probably encountered one of them is called verdigris so verdigris uh, you may have seen on the statue of liberty so pretty famously it was originally or is still made of copper but when you look at it it's got that green color so that greenish color is called verdigris so i'll pull up a picture of statue of liberty that same phenomena is used actually in a bunch of different places. So it's a very pleasing way to protect surfaces. You know, for instance, in different architecture, it's like this is a city hall with a green. Now you can see a really good example of copper, fresh copper side by side with verdigris. Uh, they redid part of the Royal Observatory. And so this is copper, all copper, but it's one has a kind of coating of that verdigris. Copper has a couple other properties. So it's biostatic, meaning bacteria and many other life forms will not grow on it. And for that reason, it was used to line parts of ships to protect against barnacles and mussels. Uh, copper alloys have been proven to kill more than 99% of disease-causing bacteria within just two hours if they're cleaned regularly. And so the EPA approved the uh, registrations of these copper alloys as antimicrobial microbial materials with public health benefits. So the EPA uh, stamp on that. And the last thing I'll mention here on copper is that it's a critical part of a protein called uh, hemocyanin, which is the oxygen carrier where we have hemoglobin, right, in our blood. It's the oxygen carrier for most mollusks, mollusks and some anthropods, such as the horseshoe crab. Because hemocyanin is blue, these organisms have blue blood rather than the red blood like we have. 
So if you've ever seen uh, the underside of a crab or if you've ever happened to see um, the blood of like a mollusk or something like that, it's got this blue color. That's why it's, it's based on copper uh, and it has a sort of tint to it. All right. So in summary, copper is a chemical element with the symbol Cu and the atomic number 29. It's a soft, malleable, and ductile metal, me uh, metal with very high thermal and electrical conductivity. A freshly exposed surface of pure copper has a pinkish orange color. Copper is one of the few metals that can occur in nature directly in a directly usable metallic form, which led to being very uh, used by very early civilizations. Copper is biostatic, like we just talked about, and over time can oxidize to form a green verdigris. Also, that's a great word to just know off the top of your head, verdigris. All right, so we talked a little about how copper, as well as silver and gold, are able to carry an electrical current well, and it's because of that single outer electron, right? So they have that electron that, that sits on the edge. And essentially, if you get a clump of copper together, the copper atoms, that outer electron, moves freely between them pretty easily. So because it's not really that tied to any other electrons, it just kind of passes among them. And that's why it conducts electricity so well. So same with gold and silver, the same sort of principle. And you also may remember from chemistry that an electron is a negatively charged uh, particle, right? So this all got me thinking. These copper atoms have so many electrons, especially if you get a big clump of them, right? They wouldn't mind if I took just a couple of them, right? Just take a couple electrons from the, from the copper. Well, I was arrested the other night for stealing people's electrons. I was heavily charged. Despite my victim saying it was an overall positive experience. Okay, well, I guess that's a problem with chemistry jokes. Sometimes you just get no reaction. <laughs> okay, last one for you. I wore my, my cheesy Shakespeare shirt today, so we'll leave that one out. I don't know if you can see it very well. All right. Uh, enough enough electrical and, and chemical jokes here. <laughs> You're welcome, Nuvlados, Trace, and Fractals. If I haven't lost P-Banger yet, <laughs> that's a good one to, <laughs> to exit on. <laughs> All right, uh, that is, so that's a little bit about copper plus some good chemistry cheesy jokes. I'm having a heck of a time keeping my plane on track here, so uh, apologies if it's been sort of wobbling back and forth. I'm listening just lying nice. Oh, hey, <laughs> P-Banger, sorry. <laughs> Hopefully you enjoyed my, my cheesy uh, electrical jokes. <laughs> Great. Uh, we were talking about it last week. It's sort of like it's either a style of humor that people uh you know tolerate and giggle at or else it's like oh jesus i think fractals is in the oh jesus camp but he uh he puts up with it all right thanks fractals for attempting to to save me from the uh from the joke there so our second topic today is a very different area is unesco world heritage sites fractals threw up the poll how many criteria are there for the for a world heritage site so is it only one? Is it 10 and it must qualify for at least one? Or no strict criteria, just a nomination process? Give folks a second to vote on that one. <laughs> In fact, was, yeah, yeah, that's fair. Actually, I do know that. Turn this autopilot on again, let's see what happens. Hey there, chattier monk, flying singer. Yeah, we, uh, it's a problem with flying jets as you get pretty, pretty well separated. All right, it looks like we have one vote for only one, one vote for 10, and then one or two votes for no strict criteria. So I try to, uh, typically I have some kind of throwaway answers on this, but this is a, an actually a, a hard question. So the right answer here is 10 and it must qualify for only one. So I don't know who got that one correct, but uh, book a guess on that. We'll talk about those 10 criteria a little bit more. So first, a connection to the park. In 1978, in combination with its Yukon neighbor, Kluani, and I practice all these pronunciations, but apologies if anyone 
knows how to say them better. I'm, I'll try my best on them, but Kluwani, which just to show, actually, I'll tell you what, let me pull up this map real quick while I talk about these. Uh, in conjunction with Kluwani, Wrangell St. Elias was recognized by the United Nations as part of the international, uh, as an international world heritage site, and it was the first binational designation. So this is the best map I could find of the two of these, but if you see this Wrangell St. Elias is we're flying here, and then over to the right here is Kluwani, and then there's actually two other parks that were added later, so there's the uh, Glacier Bay National Park, which is in the U.S., and then just above that there's uh, Tatshenshini Elsec, uh, Provincial Park, which is in British Columbia. And those were both added in 1930, 1993. Across these four units, there's 24.3 million acres, and it's one of the largest internationally protected ecosystems on the planet. All right, so let's start with what UNESCO is. So UNESCO is the United Nations Ele Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. It's a specialized agency of the United Nations aiming to promote world peace and security through international cooperation in education and sciences and culture. So this is their flag. So that's the group. Now, World Heritage Site itself... Actually, before I dive into that, let me pull up two more photos because we're going to fly over some cool areas. So you'll see just off to our right... This is, first of all, without these... These parts of the mountains were really pretty. They reminded me of the... I think it was called the Painted Mountains in um, Denali National Park when we flew there. For some reason, my game is loading a little bit partial. So some tiles seem to be lower resolution, but that's all right. So let me pull up some photos here. So Mount Sanford is the one that looks a little bit like Half Dome, just off to our right. And it looks like... There we go. Looks like this. And then Mount Wrangell, which is the other part of Wrangell St. Elias, is off in the distance. I just got a little marker dropped on it. It's a much more shallow sort of sort of mountain. It's a volcano. Actually, I think Mount Sanford is also a volcano. All right, a couple more. See, the, the closest park as far as topology goes, in my opinion, was uh, Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. Because that was the same sort of, you have some variety in the different textures of mountains, you have volcanoes side by side that are, create a really interesting landscape. So, there are totally different reasons why these mountains, or these volcanoes form, which we won't talk about today, but, uh, but still kind of cool to see. Leggy train loading, flying singer seeing the same thing, yeah. Yeah, I don't know why that is. Um, I wouldn't say it was amazing when I was prepping, but it was a little bit better. That seems okay now. Anyway, not a big deal. That's what we have the pictures for. So what is a, a World Heritage Site? A World Heritage Site is a landmark or area with legal protection by an international convention administered by the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. So this is UNESCO. World Heritage Sites are designated by UNESCO for having cultural, historical, scientific, or other form of significance. The sites are judged to contain cultural and natural heritage around the world considered to be of outstanding value to humanity. To be selected, a World Heritage Site must be somehow unique landmark which is geographically and historically identifiable and has special cultural or physical significance. For example, World Heritage Sites may be things like ancient ruins, historical structures, buildings, cities, deserts, uh, islands, lakes, monuments, all those sorts of things, wilderness areas in this case. A World Heritage Site may signify a remarkable accomplishment of humanity and serve as evidence of our intellectual history on the planet, or it may just be a place of great natural beauty. As of June 2020, a total of 1,121 World Heritage Sites, of which 800 and about 870 were cultural, about 200 were natural, and about 40 were mixed properties, uh, exist across 167 countries, and with 55 selected World Heritage Sites in each, China and Italy have the most sites on the list. So both China and Italy have 55 uh, World Heritage Sites on them. So why do they exist? By assigning a place as a World Heritage Site, UNESCO wants to help pass them on to future generations. Its motivation is that heritage is our legacy from the past, what we live with today, and that both cultural and natural heritage are irreplaceable sources of life and inspiration, something we need to protect to preserve. 
What benefits does a place get if it becomes a World Heritage Site? Uh, being listed as a World Heritage Site positively, can positively affect the site, its environment, and interactions between the two. A listed site gains international recognition and legal protection, and can obtain funds from others of the World Heritage Fund, uh, funds from among others the World Heritage Fund, to facilitate its conservation under certain conditions. Additionally, the local population around a site may benefit from significantly increased tourism revenue. All right, so I don't know about you, but I'm sold. I'd like to declare my house a World Heritage Site. So what do I need to do, right? To qualify, a country must first list a country, so there's my first problem, but a country must first list its significant cultural and natural sites into a document known as the tentative list. A country may not nominate sites that have been not included first in the tentative list. Next, it can place sites selected from that list into a nomination file, which is evaluated. This is a very, it's like a list of stages of a bureaucracy, so just, I'll go through it really quick. The short version is like, you got to put it on a list. It's got to go to the right people. It's got to be handed to the next right people. And then they'll look at it once a year. So there you go. But I'll run through it real quick. Uh, that the, the, after it's placed on a tentative list, it can be put on a nomination file, which is evaluated by the International Council on Monuments and Sites and the World Conservation Union. These bodies then make the recommendations to the World Heritage Committee. That committee then meets once a year to determine whether or not to inscribe each nominated property on the World Heritage List. Sometimes it defers its decision on re or requests more information from the country which nominated it. I mentioned in the poll, but there are 10 selection criteria for, the, for a site here, and it must meet at least one to be included on the list. Six of those criteria are cultural, and four of them are natural. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through all 10 of them, and I went and I tried to pull examples from uh, mostly in the U.S., because this is a U.S. National Parks live stream. Um, but there's a couple that I couldn't find any US ones I'll, I'll point out. And I pulled examples where the site was nominated for only one category, where I could. Sometimes they're nominated for multiple categories, which sort of makes sense. Um, you'll see as we get into them. Um, but at least I tried to pick ones where it was a clear example of why it was in that category, so it sort of sort of makes sense as a, a general idea. I will say, although I picked a bunch of examples from the United States, there are incredible places all around the world so if you're interested for a place to start uh, going into the list of world heritage sites and just clicking through some of them is a really cool way to explore the world in, in at broad not just not just in the u.s all right now we're coming up here to the copper river we'll fly out the copper river delta which is pretty pretty let me pull up a picture here before i go through these criteria so here's the mccarthy road which we're just about to cross this is a view of the mountains from that direction, so sort of the way we're facing. It's probably more like that. Just a quick pull back to Alaska. Okay. So 10 criteria. Oh, you know what? Let me do this, actually, before we get 15,000 feet. We need to land. Now, I'm going to set my plane. So after I pass that mountain, I'm going to start descending to 8,000 feet, uh, which is still not close enough to the ground really to land since the airport is at uh, sea level um, but at least it's significantly closer and 8,000 will clear you of terrain until you get to the shore I'll quickly change that and cool. All right, let's see if I can fix this real quick So what I'm doing is I'm attempting to, uh, okay, oh, I know what's going on. Yeah, yeah, okay. So I did this in the wrong order. Uh, so I'm selecting the altitude I wanna hit, and then I'm gonna descend at about 500 feet per minute, which is, or maybe a thousand feet per minute, right there. Like I said, I turn off the the overstressing the airplane part of this, which is really where this gets complicated. All right, I think that'll work. Quick interlude. Is there, oh. I 
Linux fractals. Sorry about the links. Yeah, that's our bot. Probably for the best cosmically, but um, I think there's some way to set it. So if you've attended a certain number of live streams, right, we can look at that later. All right, so uh, back on track. Ten different criteria, six cultural, four natural. The first cultural one is to represent a master... This is a quote. To represent a masterpiece of human creative genius. So in the U.S., an example of this would be Statue of Liberty. Uh, this one also qualified as the last cultural item on the list, so this is a double qualification. Uh, since it's a little bit harder to internalize, I think, what this means, another example which only qualified under this one criteria is the Sydney Opera House. So when we say masterpiece of human creative genius, this would be another example. Second example here is to exhibit an important ex interchange of human values. Oh, uh, quick random thought. I did choose this topic because the world is sort of slowly opening up again post-COVID, and it's a really good time to think about travel. Uh, so if you have the travel bug going, I hope you enjoy these series of photos of cool places in the U.S. to go to. Um, that is part of the reason why I chose this topic today. So a quick, quick mention of that. Which brings us to our second one here. So the second reason would be as an example, the architecture of Frank Lloyd Wright. And this would be to exhibit an important interchange of human values over a span of time or within a cultural area of the world on developments in architecture or technology, monumental arts, town planning, or landscape design. Another reason why. Third criteria here, an example would be Mesa Verde National Park. And this is to bear a unique or at least exceptional testimony to a cultural tradition or to a civilization which is living and or which has disappeared. Mesa Verde makes tons of sense for that. Fourth criteria here would be Taos Pueblo in New Mexico. And this is an outstanding example of a type of building, architectural, or technological ensemble or landscape which illustrates either a significant uh, illustrates significant stages in human history. So that's Taos Pueblo. Fifth one here, and I couldn't find a good example in the US, so I pulled one from Easter Island as one good example, and I have a second one that might help round out what this looks like. So the fifth criteria here, to be an outstanding example of a traditional human settlement, land use, or sea use, which is representative of a culture or cultures, or human interaction with the environment, especially when it has become vulnerable under the impact of irreversible change. So especially that second one, another example of a World Heritage Site would be this region in Switzerland. So you can see why you may want to save this sort of area. And the last cultural reason why would be to be, uh, excuse me, is uh, an example of this would be Independence Hall. And remember, this is where the principal meeting place of the second continental congress uh, continental congress excuse me was and the site of the constitutional convention in 1787 so pretty historical for the us and this criteria is to be directly or tangibly associated with events or living traditions with ideas or with beliefs with artistic and literary works of outstanding universal significance all right so those are our six uh, cultural examples. Let me pull up quickly while we're at an interlude between these two. So just off to our left, and we're going to fly over the river delta, but this whole area in the game, it looks not not all that appealing, but in the, um, in the real world, it's a gorgeous area. It looks like this. It's also great salmon fishing as well as great bird watching uh, fractals i know you're a huge fan it's like the i want to say it's the only nesting ground for the dark gray dark canadian goose maybe and the there's like two or three other birds that only nest in this particular river delta uh, as well as a great place to see swans and things like that so gotta make a trip all right so that's the river delta we're coming up on here as for natural criteria, so we have four other ones on here. The first one I'll show is Yosemite National Park. This qualifies under this criteria and the next criteria. And it's to contain superlative natural phenomena or areas of exceptional natural beauty and aesthetic importance. 
I'll quickly mention while we go through the next three, uh, Wrangell St. Elias, this national park that we're flying through right now, qualifies under all four of the criteria for natural beauty. So, or for the natural, excuse me, uh, natural criteria for it. So each of the four you hear here, Wrangell St. Elias is considered to have those. <laughs> Fractals. Yeah, you mentioned that actually. Is he, he was near Kenai Fjords though, right? Which I guess isn't that far away. Anyway, invite me when you go up to Alaska. We'll go bird watching. It'll be fun. We go river rafting too, down the delta, which you can see a little bit better now. All right, so that's Yosemite. The second criteria here, Hawaii Volcanoes National Park, uh, is a good example of this. This is to be an outstanding example, uh, to be outstanding examples representing major stages of Earth's history, including the record of life, significant ongoing geological processes in the development of landforms, or significant geomorphic or physio uh, physiographic features. So, island volcanoes in Hawaii makes a ton of sense. The ninth one here we'll use Everglades to talk about, although Everglades actually qualifies for the previous criteria and the next criteria. A lot of the natural ones qualify for multiple. So. And this is to be an outstanding example, to be outstanding examples representing significant ongoing ecological and biological processes in the evolution and development of terrestrial, freshwater, coastal, and marine ecosystems and communities of plants and animals. So you remember when we visited uh, Everglades National Park, we talked a lot about the ecosystems there. We talked about the way that the crocodiles and alligators interact with their ecosystems. So that's part of the reason that it's a World Heritage Site. And last but not least, number 10 on here also qualifies under criteria 7 and 8. So not the previous one, but the two before that, which is Mammoth Cave National Park. It's another one we visited. And this criteria is to contain the most important and significant natural habitats for in situ uh, conservation of biological diversity, including those containing threatened species of outstanding universal value from the point of view of science and conservation. So remember we talked about how there are uh, eyeless, eye, eyeless fish in Mammoth Cave, a very unique ecosystem down there. So that's part of the reason that it would qualify under this sort of criteria. The fish. That was a fish with no eyes joke. Uh, quick time check. Hey, look at that. We're doing great. All right. So that gives us a quick overview of World Heritage Sites. So in summary, a World Heritage Site is a landmark or area with legal protection by an international convention administered by, the, uh, by UNESCO. World Heritage Sites are designated by UNESCO for having cultural, historical, scientific, or other form of significance. The sites are judged to contain cultural and natural heritage around the world considered to be of outstanding value to humanity. To be selected, a World Heritage Site must be somehow unique landmark, which is geographically and historically identifiable, and has spe uh, special cultural or physical significance. There are 10 criteria they are assessed by, divided into cultural and natural components. So if we learn a little bit about World Heritage Sites, and I mentioned that I wanted to pick this because kind of travel's opening up again. Uh, also, as we're pulling around to the airport here, I'll mention this runway is, I believe, long enough to land this plane. I did do it when I was practicing. I will not try and do it live. Um, if you're feeling more adventurous, you can land somewhere in the open grasslands here, I suppose. Kind of keep it interesting. Um, but it's sort of a, a fun little trip. This is actually a, a big point of commerce in the area. So, uh, so like I was saying, I picked it because it was uh, the world's kind of opening up. It's a good time to go traveling. And uh, I know everyone's excited. So I just wanted to put a little reminder out there for your traveling, your upcoming adventures. When traveling through nature, it's always smart to bring a seasoned hiker with you. It's a well-known fact that bears find unseasoned hikers bland and tasteless. It's like the the other joke about <laughs> the joke about bears, you know, you're running with your buddy or you're out in the woods with your buddy and you hear a bear and buddy stoops down to start tying his shoes and you go, but you can't outrun the bear. He says, I don't need to outrun the bear. I just need to outrun you. All right. Two, two bear jokes for you in a World Heritage site. But that's right. Fractals. Hopped out of the way. <laughs> Glad to hear fractals. Uh, thanks, Banger. Okay. Uh, fractals, you want to post up the next poll here? And so when we will vote on our next park we'd like to explore, 
There's a couple. They're all in the same general region of the world. You'll pick out pretty quick. So Capitol Reef National Park, Arches National Park, or Canyonlands National Park. While people are voting on that one, I'll do a little sign-off here. So today we talked about Wrangell St. Elias National Park. We talked about President Jimmy Carter. We talked about copper, the element copper. And we talked about uh, UNESCO's World Heritage Sites. Fractals posted up some links to uh, the uh, Discord community if you want to come hang out there. That's great. Uh, sort of fun place for between streams or if you have questions or thoughts. I mentioned that we'll do a little poll on if we want to do some social flying around a little less uh, script, a little easier for me to prep for. It's also nice for me. Uh, uh, Fractals also posted up a link to the survey. If you have any suggestions, thoughts, ideas, I'd love to hear them. So feel free to, to add some things there. And if you just want notifications about the live stream, uh, there's also a Twitter you can follow. It's an easy way to, to keep in touch. And we'll give folks a second more here. <laughs> yeah. I, I didn't know you were such a fan, Fractals. That's pretty funny. It should be fun, too, in the game. I'm not going to lie. Uh, not to bias the answers here. Capital Reef, that's a good one. I think my eyesight has gotten worse over the course of doing this live stream. I used to be able to see the time beneath me here, and I can't anymore. <laughs> it's uh, the passage of time sort of in a different context. Oh, it's a close race. All right, we'll give just a second in case there's any, uh, any tiebreakers you want to come, or time makers you want to come in here. We'll let the wife decide the time. Give it another five seconds. Well, I round my jet at an incredible angle here. All right, sounds like we're going to Arches National Park. Yeah, I'm rounding out, yeah. It's a good way to do it. <laughs> Fractals quick closes the poll. All right. Well, with that, I'm excited to explore Arches National Park with you next week. So thank you for being my co-pilot today. And until we meet again, stay curious and keep on exploring. And I will see you all next week.